Okay, today we're gonna take the trash out of the trash and try to, I should not be holding this this way, although it's not worth anything. We're gonna try and save this Alienware R13 computer that we recently reviewed. We said it was the worst pre-built gaming PC we've ever worked on. Uh, and actually it got even worse after we filmed that video and we started inspecting it further for how can we save this computer? Is there a way we can lightly modify this and make it better, we found out it gets worse. So uh, our goal today is going to be changing as few things as possible and pretending we're Dell. So we want to maintain this aesthetic such that it exists uh, because that's Alienware's brand, but at least to make it cool properly and run at the right power limit. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and the Silent Base 802 case. The Silent Base 802 got high accolades in our review for its high build quality and its versatility in both silence focused and airflow focused builds. The 802 comes with swappable mesh panels or noise damped panels, so you have options for either approach. The Silent Base 802 case is able to fit larger builds as well without being overbearing, and it stands out for its mechanics quality and assembly quality. Learn more about Be Quiet's new case at the link in the description below. So this was a highly requested content piece from our Patreon backers in the Patreon Discord and also in the comments section where people were saying, that was a pleasant sound. People were saying, is there a way you can save this computer? And the problem with it, very quick recap, is everything. But the, the smaller piece is that the 12900KF equals a 12700KF, and that's because Dell has put exhibit cooler in it. Exhibit C right here, very small cooler, 120 mil, short tubes, and it's a high power CPU that they're dropping from 240 watts down to 160 watts, so you lose a lot of the performance. That's the key problem. There are other issues with this. I'm not going to go through it all again today, like proprietary uh, motherboard power supply, everything else, but what we're going to try and do is set some, some rules. I have to make this a fun challenge. So the rule here is going to be it has to be as close to Dell's original vision such that it exists as possible. And we think that if we pretend we're part of Dell's design team here, uh, probably they're saying, no, the look has to stay. That's the Alienware look. It needs to look like this. So we're not going to change the case. The, the easy answer to can you save this is yes, you buy a new motherboard and a new case, and then you build a computer. That doesn't really count, though. It's not as fun. So we're going to see what we can do uh, with as few mods as possible, and then we're going to get a little more creative as we go through it and add some more modifications to it. From the perspective of the cooler, I think my options are going to be the best would be put a 240 in here. I'm trying to do as few changes as possible so that if someone is misfortunate enough to have bought this, uh, this is maybe a path they can take to get it up and running without investing too much in it. So 240, maybe if it can fit, would be the quickest fix. Another option, I thought this would be really fun, is a tower cooler here with this as intake, and this as intake, and these as exhaust. So the reason for doing it that way would be that the cooler would have immediate access to cool external room ambient temperature air right here and right here. Uh, unfortunately, the top of the case is extremely blocked off here. Not great as intake, but it's less blocked off here and here than on the front of the case, and pushing all the warmed air out the front is going to be an easier, uh, like lower resistance path for flow than the opposite way that they've got it now. That's one option. I don't think a 120 mil tower cooler is gonna be enough for a 12900K to sustain 240 watts. Really stretching. So we're gonna try with the 240 first. Another option is maybe cutting a hole in the side panel. That might be altering too much, but it would give us the biggest increase in performance for the least amount of changes beyond cutting a hole in the side panel. So that's an option as well. Our AC is broken, and this is my solution to the server room. It's only broken in the server room, though. So all the people are fine. Air coolers here. Liquid coolers, some of them are here. So I want a 240. 
Uh, I'm not going to be too picky about it. Oh, this one's pretty nice. Let's see. I think that the H100i Elite is very new. This is going to be kind of an expensive solution. Um, you're mostly just paying for... The, the reason it's expensive is because you can do this with the pump cap. So as far as performance, it's the same as, as a significantly cheaper one. But you can't, you can't make a significantly cheaper one do... Can we just make sure they, they saw it at home? This. But I do think that that particular image is perfect. Ooh, nice. For the Alienware computer. Okay, time to see what will actually fit. I don't think the 120 tower is going to be enough. So the 240 is our best bet. One other thing we can modify. This has got like the double honeycomb mesh bullshit going on where, you know, it's it's plexi, it's not even glass, blocking airflow obviously, air comes in around there, and then it's this honeycomb plastic behind it, maybe you can show better this way, and then behind that is this metal honeycomb. <laughs> so, you know, double filtering is always a great way to block a ton of airflow and really hurt the performance. So, an, a mod maybe Mike could do would be to cut a big giant hole in all this and see if it improves things. Just as a reminder, we have a full review on the channel already and a teardown. You should definitely go check those out if you haven't, because that will explain a lot of the context that I'm not going to explain today, like the insanity of how this is all assembled. So, to the best of my memory, I'm going to disassemble this now. So, can we fit a 240 radiator? Okay, this is going to be so stupid. If a 240 can fit, Dell's really going to have no excuse. <laughs> like, they, they can do this. It's just, that's just Ace Attack. They make 240s. I'm a little worried about the cooler mount. Because the mount, so those, we didn't talk about this too much before. That screws into the case. That's special. I don't know that that really is going to exist elsewhere. I could get another Ace Attack cooler. That, that would allow me to reuse the screws here and the standoffs. I might have to do an Ace Attack 240. We're going to try this, though. Corsair has since moved on from Ace Attack, um, only for small reasons like, you know, lawsuits and litigation. But we're not going to be able to use Ace Attack with Corsair. That is so stupid that that's going to fit. Will it fit with the video card in? It's actually going to work. Wow. Okay. It'll still have GPU support too. So remember, it's got that's GPU support, helps in shipping. They could also just package it with some foam around it, but that's GPU support, that's GPU support, and this is GPU support. We don't need all of them. So we're going to stick with just one. I'm going to disconnect this one. I just, I just like this stack of plastic bullshit, uh, plastic appendages. Little known fact, this table lowers all the way into hell. Which is where it's, no, oh, it stopped. Where it's already here. Time to take this back out. Can't forget to disconnect the standard seven pin RGB cable. I think it'll work. Okay. Cool. The, the height's not going to be correct with this. Um, that's unfortunate. Oh, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we can thread these into Dell's proprietary case and just happen to have it work. Well, it's kind of hard to center it exactly, but pretty close. Well, 
hopefully this is making contact. Oh, okay, all right. That explain. That makes okay. All right, cool. It's better. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Okay, there is enough clearance. Cool. Wow, that looks pretty damn good. Man, if we can fix this thing with just a 240mm cooler. Dell's gonna go and implement it and be like, look, we fixed it. And we're gonna be like, no. That was just like... That was us trying to spend less than an hour fixing it. So I hope, I hope if Dell is like, hey, we should implement that, then they'll be happy. I just want it to be clear that I will not be happy. I will still be upset. So just to save everyone the time now. I require assistance. Okay. Does the assistance involve any tools that I need to bring? No. Nope. Okay. And by assistance, I mean, I don't want to do it. Okay, okay. It's worked out shockingly well. Mostly shocking because Dell oh. didn't do this. I thought it can't possibly just fit, right? Yeah, I, I because assumed that it would be two separate 120 mounts and that it wouldn't, did you? Oh, okay. It's even got the holes, like for radiators. Yeah, it really, I was not expecting that at all. It's completely upfitted for it. Because they didn't even attach the... Did they attach both of the front fans directly to the case, or did they have, like... Um, they were attached... No. They were clipped Okay. with the spring. So they're not even using these? No. Nope. Okay. So... Um, I think that... And that this is the best... This is the best cooler that is on their website. So... I don't know. So we're assuming that they reuse this for other stuff. Yeah. I'm going to let Patrick take over the cabling. If we do further modifications, it will become a mic job where it might be cutting holes and things. But for now, this is like kind of a boring solution, but it also fulfills the criteria of do and spend as little as possible. So if you're a real end user who bought this thing, then doing a 240 might be it. I'm actually going to take the power supply shroud off because I can, and it might be in the way. This just holds the cables. It looks like these plug into the power supply, but you take this off and these, this is just to hold loose cables. These don't go into the power supply. The... Okay. Um, well, let me put a couple of screws back in so I don't lose them. It looks like there is some SATA power down here that we can unearth um, that would be intended for a drive down here. I just need to decide if we're going to put this fan and RGB controller in the case. No. Do you think there will be any normal USB headers on this board? If you have a cable like this, something has gone wrong. <laughs> Great connector, works, works perfectly. There's nowhere to put cables. They all have to stay on this side of the case. This is where all the cables go so that I don't have to think about them anymore. I'll never bother anyone again. It's not the worst cable management job in the world. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. I've got a big exclamation point on this cooler. I think it probably means that 
it's not plugged in via USB hmm. because it's not. It also has this gigantic, like, I, I don't know, it's like uh, 20, 24 pins, something like that. Um, it's got this big cable coming off. This has a USB connection coming out of it. And then that goes into the hub at the other end. This USB connection here is going to nothing because there are no connections on the board. And then the SATA connection coming out of the hub, we can plug that in to power it. Um, but there's also another USB connection coming out of the hub that we can't plug into anything because there's no USB headers. All of that is very confusing and overcomplicated. The summary is that these fans are connected to the hub for RGB, but the hub has no way to be controlled because we can't connect the USB. So without control, it looks like these fans don't light up. Sometimes you'll run into RGB systems where if you're not controlling it, they'll have like a default rainbow lighting pattern. Um, Corsair has defaulted just having all the LEDs off. So potentially we could plug this into a different system and then change settings if it's saved to firmware and then plug it back in here, but it's not worth it. Um, that would tempt me to just take out the hub entirely since we're mostly just using it for RGB, which isn't working. But we need the hub to be there because that's what the pump plugs into and is powered by, which is very annoying because it means we're using this entire hub that's the size of a bar of soap and has wires coming out of it everywhere just to run a pump because Corsair and because RGB, and because Dell. They're all coming together. Um, I think I might put this CPU fan back in the back here uh, just to try and improve thermals a little more and prevent one of the many errors that will pop up when we try and turn this on. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and move this into the thermal testing room and we can get started with that in a moment. So with the fix done, it's time to test this thing again. Our goal is to turn the 12900K off that Dell puts in here back into a 12900K not a 12700K that it's become. And for this process, we needed this, an external power supply, in addition to the internal power supply, and a fan controller, because Alienware stock software and BIOS doesn't allow any fan control uh, or even monitoring of the fans beyond the predefined thermal profiles. So that was the first roadblock we ran into of many. This means that it's difficult to just simply drop in a new cooler and plot an improvement. Our compromise was to keep all the original BIOS and performance settings, but tune the fans in our new config to roughly match the stock noise level under sustained load, or about 46 dB for long workloads. To noise normalize like this, that meant locking the front radiator fans to 1500 RPM and the remaining stock fans in the rear of the case to 1600 RPM but we had to use an external controller and that's dangling out of the back of the case because Dell can't be bothered to ship a complete BIOS with basic ass functions like controlling the fan speed. Now to our credit, it's not like this looks much worse. So we've done okay there. We used Afterburner to lock the GPU fan speeds. We had to do this because Alienware software was incapable of doing that either. And uh, this is where we discovered a new problem, which is the power supply. So the power supply, sufficient though it is, it is actually a reasonably built power supply. It comes from the server division, so go figure. Uh, it is still problematic, which is that it has two tiny fans that start screaming as soon as you take away the really high flow of the bottom intake fan. So without that strong positive airflow from the front of the case, uh, they're bad. Here, take a listen. So with no way to directly control those fans, we were forced to ignore power supply noise as a factor as much as we could. For a more permanent mod, we might cut a vent for the power supply in the bottom of the case and reposition its fans. But at that point, we're now replacing a cooler. We should probably replace the motherboard for a better BIOS, and we'd definitely be modifying the case. And if you replace the motherboard, you also have to replace the power supply because this power supply has proprietary connectors that will not socket into a normal motherboard. Anyway, let's forge ahead with what we got. 
Here's a noise normalized result as plotted against an auto fan result from the original test. CPU temperatures were instantly improved by the new cooler. There was a chance that thermal performance at the beginning of the test pass would be worse since the stock configuration fans were free to spin up and scream at 50 dBA for 56 seconds. Here, we'll drop that in again. But even during the initial 241 PL2 period, the new cooler performed better with peak core temperatures of 86 degrees Celsius. That's down from 96. So we were nearly at TJ Maxx with Alienware's stock configuration in the original test, and now we're actually reasonable. Just as in the original test, there's a sharp drop in CPU temperature with a move to PL1, followed by a linear decrease as PL1 dropped steadily to its minimum. The 240mm CLC at noise normalized settings ran at 70 degrees Celsius steady, down from our sustained 88 degree result of the stock test. So that's 16 degrees cooler for doing less than an hour of work, if you count Patrick's RGB cabling, that's like half of that anyway. So Dell has no excuse here. We didn't have to modify the case. It had the holes for 240 millimeter radiators. They're just not using it. This was a $5,000 computer. It was the max spec. We didn't choose the 120 millimeter liquid cooler. That was their best one. That's the crazy part. So Actually, nothing really had to be done to just get the CPU thermals under control. It's still not fixed. There are a lot of problems we're going to get to in a moment. But shoving a 240 cooler in the front, you could buy an Asetek unbranded cooler, stick the alien head on it, and it'd probably be pretty cheap. Not much more than the 120 that Asetek's already making with the custom radiator size, certainly the custom tube length, and it'd be, it'd be halfway fixed. Except for the motherboard, the power supply, and the case. But that part would be fixed. On to frequency. The fixed R13 plots its frequency at about 4800 MHz during the initial boosting window, holding at 4500 to 4600 through the decay period, and landing at 4350 MHz for steady state. Its E-core performance ran at 3400 MHz dead for the entire test, showing a flat line thanks to thermal compliance. The original system decayed much faster for frequency, with a sharp fall off as we hit 96 degrees Celsius in the initial window. It fell to 4300 to 4400 MHz, so that's consistently 200 MHz lower during that decay window, and the clock ultimately settled about 100 MHz lower than the P-cores in our updated version of testing, and that's with the turbo limit still in place. E-core performance on the original test was far worse, bouncing around erratically and unpredictably. This was resolved with the cooler upgrade. GPU thermals are now Next, during the original stock test, the GPU fans rose to a maximum of 69% duty cycle, and for the most part, it remained there. For our 46 dB noise normalized test, we manually locked the GPU fans to that speed from the beginning. However, we had the powerful and loud stock intake fans in the case replaced with the radiator and fan combo. It makes sense then that temperatures were slightly higher in the new configuration for the GPU, leveling out at 75 degrees for the GPU instead of the original 72 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, the proximity of the GPU to the power supply, and we did remove the shroud because it was just creating obstructions, means that there's not much room for us to get creative and improve the airflow. Fortunately, however, three degrees here doesn't hurt performance, and the GPU was the best cooled part in the system anyway. The 16 degrees of the CPU is worth a lot more than the 3 degrees of the GPU. So all that forced intake at the bottom of the case, including the duct that directed it, although yes, it benefited the GPU a bit, the frequencies haven't moved much on the GPU core, just if you're wondering, a lot of that was designed for the power supply, is what we've gathered, because the power supply fans, they start screaming with the removal of all that guided intake, so it was less GPU and more power supply. With that done, we could then increase the power limits to match the proper stock behavior of a 12900KF. As soon as we tried, though, we ran into problems. First, the overclocking menu completely disappeared from BIOS. We plugged some fans back in, and it came back. We unplugged the same fans again, and it stayed. We still don't know what specifically made the menu disappear, but it encompasses almost all CPU and memory settings, including XMP. So losing it was a major problem. Dell has tied its BIOS menus to the fan headers, which seems actually insane, and reinforces that a true fix would involve a new motherboard. This likely ties in with the underspec VRM. They probably know it's underspec and know it'll blow up if it's not protected in BIOS. Once in the menu, we found that we weren't allowed to increase power limits above 241 watts for PL2 or 210 watts for PL1, which are the original limits that the system shipped with, and below Intel guidelines for the 12900KF, which is infinite turbo. Tau, or the time limit, could not be altered at all in Dell's BIOS. To be clear, these settings don't technically break any Intel rules. 
They just suck. They're not good. And Intel itself has now moved on to infinite turbo at high power limits. The rest of the OC menu was irrelevant to our purposes, but we couldn't help but notice that the options were pathetically threadbare with two OC profiles defined only as level one and level two with no way to work with E cores and P cores separately. We're having to rely actually on Keegan's old B-roll footage from the original review because that menu has since disappeared once again. We gave up the BIOS as a lost cause and we moved on to applications. The particular piece of bloat where we started with was Alienware Command Center. The Command Center offers a choice of three thermal profiles with zero explanation or the option to create a mysterious custom profile with no settings. Maybe that's because we disconnected the stock cooler or maybe that feature was always broken. We don't know. CPU overclocking offers one slider each for CPU frequency, voltage, and voltage offset, ignoring the fact that voltage isn't just a thing. There are multiple voltages. Those are literally, though, the only options. There's no power limit controls. There's no tau, which is what we needed. There's no advanced controls. So in order to get the child safety lock off of the BIOS and get the grown-up controls, we had to download Intel's XTU. XTU allowed us to freely adjust all of the missing settings, including PL1, PL2, and Tau. Unfortunately, however, we found that PL1 would always drop below 210 watts under sustained load anyway, regardless of what we configured. So for anyone stuck with an R13, XTU is the most reasonable option for CPU tweaking. It will still perform like a 12700, even with thermal performance improvements. Uh, at least in things that are entirely CPU bound, like in Chromium and Blender and anything that's CPU workload, you're getting a worse CPU, even though you're paying for the good one. And Dell has made it impossible to resolve that from anything short of a motherboard replacement. And just to be clear, what we're doing, all the stuff we're talking about, it's not overclocking. Dell will pretend like it's overclocking and they are going to sit there and watch this video and think about how we're so unreasonable because we're enthusiasts who want to overclock it. That's not what we're doing. We're just trying to get it back to the expected clocks, which happen to be over the clocks that Dell ships with. That is not, however, overclocking. It's just increasing the clocks to stock. And I know this is what they're thinking because we've worked with a lot of companies like this. The fix then, if we wanted to go a step further and we talked about this, it would basically be to get something like a micro ATX motherboard like this one, this is AMD though, and put it in there. The problem you run into is because this, this is the biggest possible case they could make with the smallest possible size for a motherboard, you'll probably have to use micro ATX and you might have to use creative use of a Dremel to get it to fit. And then you're gonna lose your front IO, so you'll need to buy something to shove up there or if you're able to do electrical wiring on your own, you can probably reroute the, ex well, no you can't because they're attached to the motherboard. I, for a second, I forgot that uh, they attached it to the board and I thought it was just a weird non-standard cable, but it is in fact, never mind. You can't use the front IO. So you need a new case also, if we're being reasonable here, unless you really want the look of the Alienware one, in which case, okay, I guess, but you have to buy something to shove up in the front for front I.O. So again, we keep coming back to you're basically harvesting the CPU and the GPU and you're building a new computer around those. If it's a steep enough discount, then okay. But if not, you should just avoid this. Uh, we've seen some of these sold on eBay sans GPU for a lot cheaper. The only real value there is the CPU, unless you're willing to have a severely underperforming system because of things like the motherboard. And the VRM is also under spec, which we think is why they're limiting this so hard, because as we've seen from photos sent by our viewers in the past, some of these Alienware motherboards, the VRM blows up with a high-end CPU in it. Honestly, any further modification beyond all of this just isn't worth the time. Uh, we tried pretty hard to get further, but even if you do manage to circumvent the firmware limits that are in place, the hardware just isn't up to the task of one, actual overclocking, or two, stock clocking apparently so and most of this is proprietary junk that can't really be rehoused or replaced uh, in another system so that's the end of it for those of you who ask can you fix it the answer is it's too far gone the closed loop liquid cooler change helps we could brute force this and hack our way through it but you start looking at what's reasonable and once you get to a new motherboard, a new power supply, a new case, a new cooler, it is no longer reasonable and the RAM's not good either. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. 
go to store.gamersaccess.net and grab some of our coasters, mod mats for PC building and modification like we worked on in this video, or toolkits to help us out directly as we buy more systems like this and try to find good ones. Or go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess for bonus videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.